the Spitfire, the unbreakable barrier breaker, broke barriers in many ways. It broke racial barriers, gender barriers, and technological barriers. But most importantly, it broke the belief of Nazi superiority. In 1931, the Supermarine Aviation Works won the Schneider Trophy for the third straight time. The Supermarine S6B set the world speed record 17 days later at a speed of 407.5 miles per hour. This plane was the best work, up until that time, of designer R.J. Mitchell and earned him a CBE, Commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. He had always dreamed of making planes, and now he set his sights on designing and building a plane for the Royal Air Force. The RAF recognized the expansion of the German armed forces and wanted to prepare, and so asked companies to design a new fighter plane. In 1934, with their first attempt, Supermarine did not win the contract. The RAF awarded the contract to the company that built the faster plane. The Gloucester Gladiator, with a top speed of 257 miles per hour, beat Mitchell's Supermarine Type 224 with a top speed of 228 miles per hour, and sent him back to the drawing board to begin work on a completely new type of fighter. The Spitfire was the first British fighter plane that was designed and built with metal and not wood and fabric. Mitchell also used a new elliptical wing design. He had used it before in a different project with good results, and so he used it now in his new design. There are four different types of wings, A-wing, B-wing, C-wing, and D-wing. The A-wing was fitted with eight 7.7mm Browning machine guns. The B-wing had two 20mm Hispano cannons and four 7.7mm machine guns. The C-wing was the best design as it was a mix of A-wing and B-wing. It can be configured like the A-wing, the B-wing, or with four 20mm cannons. It was also able to be speed produced. And finally, the D-wing. The D-wing was used for the recon Spitfires, and instead of wing armament, they had extra fuel space so that they could fly farther than the other models. Originally, the Spitfire was called K-5054, or the Type 300. Later on, Supermarine named it the Spitfire because one of the owner's daughters was a Spitfire, and he named it after her. R.J. Mitchell said it's just the type of silly name they would give it. He had wanted to name it the Shrew. The Spitfire, with all of its technological improvements, broke many barriers in design, speed, and durability, but it also broke racial and ethnic barriers. Although it was a RAF fighter during World War II, not only British pilots flew the Spitfire. There were people from around the world who came to Britain and flew for the RAF. There were pilots from America, India, Trinidad, Barbados, Poland, France, and even Czech pilots who flew the Spitfire during World War II. Most of the people that flew from France and Poland had fled their countries when the Nazis took over. There were even some American squadrons before America entered the war. They called themselves the Eagle Squadrons. Americans were not allowed to join the RAF because America was a neutral country. To get around this, many of the Americans pretended to be Canadian so that they wouldn't get in trouble. The RAF during World War II was not like other air forces of the time. There were no segregation rules, so sometimes pilots from all different races and ethnic backgrounds would be in the same squadron, but there were also squadrons made up of only one nationality. Like the American Eagle Squadron, there was a Polish 303 Squadron, and there were many Czech and Indian squadrons. The Spitfire also broke gender barriers. Many women pilots flew the Spitfire. However, none of them ever got to fly the plane in battle. They were allowed to fly the Spitfire and other planes from the factories to the front lines so that the pilots had a constant flow of new planes when theirs were shot down. 
Pauline Gower was the first woman to join the Air Transport Auxiliary, and she initially recruited eight other women. Later, there were over 150 women who flew for the ATA. The ATA made it possible for the eligible male RAF pilots to be available for the operational flying. Like the male RAF pilots, there were women pilots from all over the world. Women from Argentina, Chile, Poland, and even America flew for the ATA, and many of them flew Spitfires and Hurricanes. Many of the women were good enough pilots to be able to fly two- and four-engine bombers, sometimes by themselves and always without radios. Some of the women pilots that flew in the Air Transport Auxiliary include Joy Lofthouse, Mary Ellis, and American Nancy Stratford. Joy Lofthouse, who enlisted for the ATA when she was 16 and a half, learned to fly airplanes before she even knew how to drive a car. Here, Mary Ellis, in an interview on BBC, tells what it was like to fly the Spitfire. You know, I flew 400 Spitfires. And occasionally I would take one up and go and play with the clouds, which was so delightful and lovely. Oh, I can't tell you how wonderful. In another interview, she tells about how when she landed a bomber, the ground crew did not believe she was the pilot. I said, I am the pilot. <laughs> and they didn't believe me. And they actually went in the airplane and searched it to find a pilot. And they came back and said, there's nobody there, you must be. During my research, I found an American ATA pilot, Nancy Stratford, who now lives in California, and we exchanged emails. After the war, Nancy came home to America and was the first female helicopter pilot in Alaska. She was the fourth ever woman to be licensed in helicopters. She said flying helicopters was just like flying a new plane, but I had more experience in planes, so I preferred them to helicopters. She said her favorite plane to fly was the Spitfire, but she also flew some bombers like this Barracuda and some other fighters like the P-51 Mustang. Nancy had wanted to fly since she was 16 when, for her birthday, her brother bought her a training flight. She did not get the chance to fly again until she was 20. Nancy went to Britain in June 1942 and said that flying the Spitfire was magnificent. She said that her favorite model to fly was the photo reconnaissance Spitfire as it was clean because it had no weapons to disrupt the air. The women of the ATA also broke the pay barrier. They were the first to receive equal pay for equal work. Because the women proved themselves to be as capable as the men who flew for the ATA, the RAF gave the women equal pay. The Spitfire was one of the fastest planes of its time and was one of the best fighter planes in general. This plane was such a legend that after World War II, many nations purchased Spitfires for their air forces. In fact, during the Arab-Israeli War of 1948, Spitfires faced off against Spitfires in combat as both the Egyptian and the Israeli Air Forces flew Spitfires. In the early days of World War II, after the Germans had taken over most of Europe, the Spitfire began to show how strong it was. After fighting the Germans in France, especially in Dunkirk, the easily recognizable Spitfire started to represent the British will to survive and fight back. Not only did the Spitfire inspire the British people to keep on fighting during the Battle of Britain, but it also struck fear into the enemy. It was the one plane the pilots of the Focke Wolf 190 and the Messerschmitt 109s feared. It helped defeat the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain, and it kept the spirits of the British people alive. It came to represent freedom and inspired them to never give up. Even though it was a killing machine, it could also be fun. I read one story of how Spitfire pilots modified their planes to drop beer kegs for the thirsty troops after D-Day. The Spitfire even broke the barriers of war. It really was and is the unbreakable barrier breaker.